Okay, I'm going to get us started, um, and I'm sure we'll have others joining us as we get going. But hi, and welcome to History Happy Hours. My name is Callie McCune. I'm the Public Programs, oops, coordinate, Public Programs Manager over at the Indiana Historical Society. It's really great to have you all here to talk about the Madam C.J. Walker Collection and have our conversation with Alelia Bundles. Um, I have, it's been a joy to put this together with her. Um, and so I can't wait for Alelia and Susan to share um, some of the great stories behind the collection. This happy hour today was brought to you with support from One America Financial Partners, a national provider in the insurance and financial services marketplace. We're really appreciative that One America is helping us make these happy hours happen today. Before I hand it over to Susan and get started, I wanna go over a few Zoom logistics. I know we're getting really good at this, but I wanna make sure if this is your first time or your third time that you're keeping your Zoom skills up. You're all gonna be muted for most of this event. You'll know you're muted because there's a little red a microphone that is X'd out next to your picture. Um, we'll keep you, unmuted for mo keep you muted for most of the event, but if you do want to unmute yourself, you can do that by clicking on the microphone button in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen if you're on a computer or tapping it on the top toolbar on an iPad. You can toggle between multiple views on Zoom. Because we'll be sharing the screen for a lot of this, if you go to the top, there's a way you can split it so you can see the chat on one side and also see or pictures of all of us as well as the PowerPoint um, and some of the images that we'll have up on the screen. Um, but if you choose and you wanna, we also suggest you view this in speaker mode, but if you wanna do this in gallery mode and see us all as little Brady Bunch squares, you can do that by clicking on the, and toggling on the button at the top of your screen if you're on a computer. Um, and then it's sort of at the top on the toolbar if you tap on an iPad. Also keep an eye on the chat box. We'll be dropping tidbits and some URLs as we go. Um, just as a tip for Zoom, sometimes you have to right click and copy URLs in order to paste them into your favorite web browser. It doesn't always connect in Zoom, but almost all the links we share will also be shared um, in the thank you email that you're gonna get about 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So don't worry if you miss something. If you enjoy this program, I hope you'll consider coming back for more. And I know some of you already are joining us for your second or third or fourth ah. hours, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, we're continuing our way. series next week on Thursday with Underwear Through the Ages with our um, friend Karen DePaw. Um, she's a fashion historian and one of my coworkers that works down the hall from me normally. Um, and then we're gonna have a special edition of History Happy Hours on Saturday, May 23rd. If you're free, come join us for Racing Rivals and Track Talk with IMS historian Donald Davidson and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway president, Doug Bowles. It should be a really interesting conversation. You can find out about all that and loads more that we're doing virtually from the Historical Society at indianahistory.org. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Susan Hall Dotson to get us started um, and enjoy the show. Evening, everybody. And welcome to History Happy Hour. Um, you're all here for a reason. And the real reason is Alelia Bundles. And for those of you who don't know a lot about her, I'm going to tell you just a little to keep it going. Um, so. The one thing that's the most important here today is that she is the great, great granddaughter of Madam C.J. Walker. And she's the great granddaughter of Alelia Walker. But she's also magnanimous and gracious and smart. She went to Harvard, she went to Columbia, and she's from right here in Indianapolis. But one of the other things is She's a producer of the news. So she made a whole lot of people look really good as a producer. So you guys know Peter Jennings, you know, Connie Chung, ABC, NBC, Nightly News, the Today Show. You know, just a little, just a little bit. She did a little bit of stuff. But what she's really, really known for is the reason we're here now, is that she is the biographer for Madam C.J. Walker. And so with further ado, welcome Alelia to IHS 
happy hour. So it's good to be talking with folks in my hometown and others who are tuning in from other places. And I will add, I am a proud graduate of North Central High School. <laughs> oh, so since this is happy hour, we always start off with, what are you drinking? So, so I'm drinking tea. <laughs> and what was Madam Walker's drink? So Madam Walker probably was very discreet about what she drank because, you know, there was a lot of uh, prohibition amongst the club women. But I would say perhaps she might have had a sip of sherry from time to time. Ah, and how about Lelia, as she was known while she was in Indianapolis, but later, Alelia, your namesake? Definitely champagne. <laughs> no question. <laughs> well, since she is a woman after my own heart and I'm of hers, that's what I have a mini bottle of Prosecco and a bottle of water. So <laughs> without further ado, let's move ahead. Um, tell me what about this collection? What's the story behind the collection coming to IHS? So I just, I'm going to just show this for everybody who doesn't already subscribe to Traces. Um, I wrote about the history of how this collection got there. And Madam Walker was really smart about the people she surrounded herself with. We'll talk about F.B. Ransom a little later. But Violet Davis Reynolds was a secretary who went to work for the Walker Company in 1914 when she was a teenager. She was still working for the company in the 1970s. And it was really Mrs. Reynolds who gathered all of the material. There had been letters and business records, and they were in boxes and file cabinets throughout the Walker building. And Mrs. Reynolds made sure that those things were saved. And that's how they have ended up at the Indiana Historical Society. She was the keeper of the flame. So how did we actually, at the Indiana Historical Society, get the collection? I so think it was in like 84. Yes, so, so really sort of starting in the late 70s, early 80s, the Walker building was about to close. And um, there were people at the Indiana Historical Society who realized there was a treasure there. It was a time when most historical societies really didn't have very much about women and people of color in their communities. And some of the curators and the archivists at the Historical Society began talking with Mrs. Um, Reynolds and sort of shepherding this along. And fortunately, um, in the, you know, at the Historical Society, there, was, there were funds and there was a will to diversify the collection. And so that is how Madam Walker, the Madam Walker papers ended up there. I think we may actually have um, an image of the signing of the, um, of bringing the collection there. So it, it's a couple of, there we go. So, so Gail Thornbro, who was the secretary, um, the leader at the Indiana Historical Society, her sister, Emma Lou, taught at Butler and was a real uh, scholar of black history. So both of them knew the importance of Madam Walker being in Indianapolis. And really, I think because of Gail Thornbro and because of Mrs. Reynolds, the collection ended up being there with uh, Eric Pumroy and Bob O'Neill uh, and others who were really involved in um, trying to diversify the collection and to tell the whole story of the communities in Indianapolis. At the time, why was the Walker closing or the building closing at that time? So the building was, um, you know, it was, it was really in major need of repair. And the company had really thrived and been a major player in black hair care through the 1950s. But by the late 1950s, early 1960s, there were other competitors that were really kind of outpacing the Walker Company. It wasn't keeping up. So by this time in the 1970s, the company was really had really shrunk in terms of its importance. And uh, it just really wasn't keeping up. And it, it needed to be in a smaller place. And the building Fortunately, there were leaders in the community, preservationists who realized that the building needed to be preserved and saved. And so with the help of the Lilly Endowment and with some federal funds, the building was remodeled. So the building that we now call the Madam Walker Legacy Center 
was that building that had been built in 1927 that's now a National Historic Landmark. Okay. So when it first came, I, my understanding is that everyone did not have access to the papers. Do you recall why that was? Uh, partially it was my fault. <laughs> You're outing me, Susan. Yes. Well, not in a bad way. <laughs> but when, when the papers were first uh, donated to the Indiana Historical Society, Alex Haley was actually working on what was supposed to become a miniseries and a book. And I was doing the research for him. So this is, I think the papers came in 1982, three, 82 or three. And so the, the collection was closed. Now that often happens Mm -hmm. um, with a major collection if a book is being written or in the case of, you know, elected officials, they may close their papers for 20 or 30 or 40 years until after they die. But in this case, we wanted to finish a project. Well, Alex died in 1992 without having written a book, but by then I was working with his, the woman who had been his editor at Roots, um, for Roots, Lisa Drew. So I needed to finish my book and it, it was a bit, um, selfish on my part, I will say, but I wanted to make sure that I had the first crack at this book. So everybody was very cooperative and I so appreciate it. Now, the beauty of this is it's totally open to everybody. And with these, we'll talk about this later, but a lots of people can see these amazing images and records and can write to their heart's content. And I, I mean, I actually do have to just say, um, the number of scholars who have used the collection, we'll talk about that, but Tyrone McKinley Freeman, who mm -hmm. is a professor at the School of Philanthropy for IU, used the collection to write his dissertation, and his uh, dissertation is becoming a book called the Gos Madam Walker's Gospel of Giving, which will be out in November. So this makes me extremely pleased to know that these papers are becoming books and movies and, and other projects. Absolutely. Without these papers, we too would not be able to, in addition to sharing them, to put on the You Are There 1915 Madam C.J. Walker Empowering Women exhibit. So without the papers, we would not be able to fully tell that story. We would have to rely on outside sources if they existed. And we do use outside sources because it's important to have a balanced um, story and storytelling facts. So we have images from Library of Congress, and we have images from you and um, other documents as well. Tell us a little bit about your personal collection outside of what we have at IHS. So I think we have a picture of some items from my collection. So in addition to the papers that um, Mrs. Reynolds saved in the building, I actually come from a family of pack rats. <laughs> people who save everything. And when, um, when Alelia Walker died in 1931, my grandmother May moved the contents of her apartment in Harlem to Indianapolis. And those things, when I was, my grandmother died in 1945 and my parents and I moved back to Indianapolis. They had both grown up there and I was born in Chicago and we lived in Atlantic City, but we moved back to Indianapolis in 1955, and we stayed for a while in the, uh, my grandfather's apartment on North Street. And my grandmother's bedroom had not been touched since she died 10 years earlier. And in that room were Alelia Walker's clothes and her photographs and her scrapbooks and her books from the Dark Tower, um, little miniature mummy charms that she had gotten in Egypt, photographs of Madam Walker, all kinds of things. So that became what now is my Madam Walker family archives and with Hollinger boxes galore and um, things that allow me to tell the story. So those things supplement the things that the really massive collection that's at the Indiana Historical Society. So tell me what's your favorite? What are the ones that touch your heart the most? So those mummy charms that I mentioned, this was the, the when Alelia Walker went to, she went on a trip to London, Paris, Rome for the coronation of the Pope, Monte Carlo to the casinos, Cairo, Addis Ababa to meet the uh, Empress. But among the things she had were these little, really small charms, a sarcophagus 
And I would pull those out and as a little girl play with those. There were, um, there was a mother of pearl uh, opera glasses, a pair of opera glasses that was in the, in the drawers. There was a beautiful um, ostrich feather fan. And then there was a big green lacquer secretary that was at the uh, entrance to my grandfather's apartment that was filled with paper clips and stamps and little cubby holes. And so those kinds of things are, if I had to run out of my house for a fire, those are the things that I would grab. <laughs> Tell us about some of I the papers. I would carry the furniture, but. <laughs> there you go. What about some of the papers? Tell us about some of the documents that are in your collection that may not be replicated in other collections, including ours at IHS? So one of the most precious documents for me is a petition that Madam Walker signed along with uh, a number of Harlem leaders, Fred Moore, who was the publisher of the New York Age, James Weldon Johnson, who is the famous uh, composer who wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing. But this petition is actually, a replica is on display in the You Are There exhibit. But this petition is something that Madam Walker signed after the silent protest parade that happened in New York after the East St. Louis riots of 1917. And Madam Walker was on the executive committee of the NAACP's New York chapter. They organized this massive march up Fifth Avenue with 5,000 African Americans marching silently to protest lynching. And after this march happened, Madam Walker and a group of Harlem leaders traveled from New York to Washington, D.C. with a petition urging President Woodrow Wilson to support legislation to make lynching a federal crime. So I particularly love that because it shows her activism. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my um, go-to spaces always in the exhibit. And to show the, the balance, that item comes from you personally, but we have pictures and images of the silent protests that come from Library of Congress. And in order to flesh that out, you, you have to beg and borrow from other institutions. Um, and we do the same. We loan items and objects and 3D items as well to other institutions to further enhance and tell the stories. Um, tell me more about some of the images that you share um, that are up for slides and who so, they are and why you picked them. So this one, I, well, that we just saw that first from the Black History News and Notes. I will tell you all, uh, many people knew Wilma Gibbs and Wilma was there at, and with, working with the collection uh, for many, many years and was the editor, not the first editor, but the longtime editor of Black History News and Notes. And I have almost every single issue going back to the beginning. It's something that I really cherish. And now there are wonderful articles in Traces. So if you aren't already a member of the Indiana Historical Society, I urge you to join so that you can get Traces um every quarter and okay so we'll go we'll look at the next slide and i think that is of alelia walker so we're going to go backwards there we oh okay well then no well we can stay there that, that, that one we can stay on that one so this one i really like showing and I, I mean this is also at the um indiana historical society in in the historical society's collection but this one is particularly interesting to me because you see the, the corporate uh, team for the Walker Company. So there's Alelia Walker on the front row in the white dress. And then in the middle on the front row is Robert Lee Brokenberg, who was a very well-known attorney in Indianapolis during the early 20th century. He actually uh, put, wrote the Articles of Incorporation for the Walker Company and was the first black state senator uh, in Indiana. And then next to him to the right is Violet Davis Reynolds, Madam Walker's secretary who came to Indianapolis as a teenager. And um, her name was Violet Davis and her grandchildren have bo were both involved in the exhibit. TJ did the beautiful artwork that's there. And her granddaughter uh, is one of the actors and her, 
new, uh, what, what would have been her great grandchild is named Violet, a, a new baby that arrived within the last several months. But Mrs. Ms. Davis, Violet Davis married Todd Reynolds, who was the mailman for the Walker Company. So they met while he was delivering the mail and she was the person opening the mail. On the next row behind Alelia Walker is F.B. Ransom, Madam Walker's longtime attorney who was among the wisest hiring decisions that she ever, that she ever made. Uh, behind Mr. Ransom is Alice Kelly, who was the, what they called the four lady of the factory, but we'd say now the manager of the factory. She had been a, the dean of girls at a black boarding school in Kentucky. Then to the right from her is Harry Evans, who was the advertising manager after Madam Walker died. I don't know who the woman in the middle is, but then next to her is Esther Heidelberg, I think, and she was one of the secretaries. The, for those who haven't seen Two Dollars and a Dream, Stanley Nelson's film, and Stanley is Mr. Ransom's grandson and a, and a very famous filmmaker, Esther Heidelberg is in that film. So I would, you can find it on YouTube. And I don't know who the gentleman is next to Esther, and I don't know who the woman is uh, in front of him and behind Violet Davis Reynolds. But this is a group of uh, Walker Company employees and executives taken probably sometime, I'm, I'm guessing maybe 1927 when the building opened, it would have been around that period of time. So then we're going to look at the right behind that should be two. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So these are, so two photos of Alelia Walker. The one on the left is, was taken by a, a well-known photographer named Robert Mercer. So while people know James Vanderzee's name, Robert Mercer is not as well known, but he was taking a lot of really beautiful photographs, especially of some of the prominent um, Harlemite. So this just this is a picture taken probably around 1926 or 27 um, and just shows the beautiful clothes that she wore. She loved clothes. When she was in Paris, she bought designer clothes that she brought back, but a lot of her clothes were made by uh, African-American seamstresses. And then the picture um, on the right is something that I recently um, acquired, and this is um, She's much younger in this picture. I really love the hairstyle. I love her intentional look. But this is among the things when you you think you found every single piece of you know paper. And Susan, we'll talk about the importance of people and their their papers. But my grandfather, when my grandfather was in the apartment on North Street, he had boxes and trunks worth of things. And when he left. Indianapolis to move back to Arkansas in the late 1960s, he put a lot of things in storage at Stewart Storage because the Stewart family is a long time, you know, long time family friends of ours. And I knew my grandfather had not been paying the bills for the storage unit. And so I just thought I'd never find any things, but thank you to Tony Stewart, who now runs the Stewart Moving and Storage, these things were somewhere way in the back of the warehouse. And mm -hmm. over the last couple of years, Tony has found these photographs, found these scrapbooks, found books from Lelia Walker's personal library and given them to me. So these things continue to turn up. And this was one of the treasures that I just recently received. Never thought I would see something like this. Alelia, before we move on to the other pictures, can we do a tiny um, genealogy lesson for everyone that doesn't know how you make it to Madam Walker? Um, I know I've studied your genealogy extensively, but not everyone might. And it's it. confusing. <laughs> so yes, thank you so much for, for saying that. So Madam C.J. Walker, born on a plantation in Delta, Louisiana in 1867, died in 1919. She was married uh, three times. Her first husband, um, Moses McWilliams, whom she married at 14, they had a child, Lelia, who you see here, their only child who was born when she was 17. She was born in 1885. 
died in 1931. Alelia McWilliams, her birth name, took the name Walker from Madam Walker's third husband, her stepfather, C.J. Walker. She was married three times, and she actually had no biological children. But, they, but she adopted my grandmother, May. Now that's a whole May's biological family and the connection is a story that I can tell quickly when Sarah Bree Love, AKA Madam Walker and Lelia lived in St. Louis. They belonged to St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. One of their fellow parishioners was a man whose last name was Hammond. When they moved to Indianapolis, his mother happened to live across the alley from them and they began to meet his relatives. So there was already a family connection. One of his sisters had recently become widowed. Her husband had died and she was the third generation of women in her family to be a widow in her thirties with eight children. May was one of those children. And she began modeling for Madam Walker because she had very long braids. I should have put a picture of May in here, but she had very long braids and Madam Walker's primary selling product was Madam Walker's wonderful hair grower. So May was a maid, I mean, was a, was a, um, was a, a model for the Walker company. She traveled with Madam Walker and because her mother wanted her to have opportunities for education, the Walkers agreed to adopt her, legally adopt her, and promised to educate her. And so May became, went to Spelman College and later became president of the company. May had two children from her first marriage, my uncle Walker, in this big fabulous wedding uh, that she, to somebody she didn't want to marry. And then her second husband was my grandfather, Marion Perry. So there was Madam C.J. Walker, her daughter, Alelia Walker, my grandmother, May, who was adopted by Alelia Walker, and my mother, whose name was Alelia May Perry, and then me. So I'm the third Alelia. And, and I know people are still confused. <laughs> well, I'm back. Can you hear me now? Great. All those internet storms we were talking about, well, it waited till the sun came out. The sun is shining and my internet's gone down twice, but oh we're back at it. Um, tell me a little bit about how you distinguish some of the old pictures with the new pictures. You know, how did, did any of that change the narrative? Well, um, yes. And it's the, the picture's not so much though, to some degree. But I'll tell you what has really helped change the narrative among the things that were in the warehouse at Stewart's moving is um, Alelia Walker's journal from her trip to Europe and Africa and the Middle East. I, and as I'm writing this new biography of her, I'm writing about this trip because I, it's covered in the newspapers. I have some letters from her third husband who's writing to her while she's overseas all these wonderful love letters. I don't have her letters to him, but I have his letters to her. So I knew where she was. Um, and I was guessing about the people with whom she might have interacted, people who I knew were friends of hers or people who would have been in Paris at the same time. I'd done some research in newspapers and you know, columns would talk about who, who was in a particular place. But her journal from the trip, when she, start, she started writing in it, as she was on the SS Paris in first class, traveling from New York to France. And then therefore, she doesn't have everything, every single thing that she did, but it says, I had dinner with, and it's a famous musician, Louis Mitchell. I went shopping at, I arrived here. So that has given me, I'm not just guessing and speculating, I now have documentation for that. So that's an incredible gift from the gods. Absolutely. Well, they, I call them the angels in the archives, too. You have this big oh. box, and you don't know it's there until you know it's there. And some of the items that I pulled, one of my favorite items is the her passport application, and it's from 1919. Um, and it may be one of the last pictures also, and it's one of the la uh, older pictures than what we're typically um, accustomed to seeing. 
And that document in and of itself um, helps us to see, and it's hard to read, but in the two thirds down, it shows where she was planning to go. But in the other part, it talks about all the places that she went. Tell us more about Madam's trips to Analelia's as well, to Costa Haiti, to um, Panama. So this was a, a, among the many discoveries. And you know, thank goodness, I could not have written my books without this body of work. And I think we are really lucky. There are so few companies and individuals, women and especially people of color in the early 20th century who have this kind of documentation. But what among the things that we know because of all of the papers that are there is that Madam Walker traveled to the Caribbean and Central America in uh, 1913. She went, she went to Cuba, as it's a Cuba, Panama, Haiti, Costa Rica, and Jamaica for about two months or so in between November and January. And she is writing back to Mr. Ransom and telling him what she's seeing. He is putting articles in the black newspapers documenting, but she was going to places where she knew there were, were large black populations because she was selling products to African-American women. And then in um, 1918, as, the, as World War I was ending, she and a number of African-American leaders wanted to go to Europe uh, to observe the peace talks at Versailles. She had become very involved in the rights for black soldiers and discrimination against them and what was going to happen to the African colonies that Germany had been um, overseeing. And so she and a number of others were applying for passports so they could travel to Europe, especially to Paris. So England and Italy are also on there, but France was her primary goal. And is it true that she was then denied a passport to travel or visas at that time to travel to Europe? That is absolutely true. Um, almost all of the African-Americans who applied for passports were denied passports because the Woodrow Wilson administration was very afraid that they would talk about racism and racial discrimination in America and did not want that to be part of the international conversation. So her passport was turned down. And Mr. Ransom, uh, ever the keeper you know, of the flame and guarding Madam Walker, had kind of warned her that she, because she was so outspoken, she was um, you know, hanging out with people like A. Philip Randolph, <laughs> who founded the um, Brotherhood of Pullman Porters, or Sleeping Car Porters, and Ida B. Wells, the fiery anti-lynching activist, and Marcus Garvey. Uh, so he said, you know, these are people who the government is not looking favorably upon. And she, in fact, she and Ida B. Wells were spied upon by a black spy who was working for the War Department. There are classified documents that are now unclassified at the National Archives that shows that they were called Negro subversives, which, and their main crime was that they were really speaking up for social justice and civil rights. So before there was COINTELPRO, there was COINTELPRO in America. There you go. <laughs> um, some things change, the more they remain the same too. Right. Um, as if Kelly, if you can go to the ad that has the map, how this links to that as well in telling these stories and how you could utilize these collections that we have um, for Madam Walker. This is an advertisement. And for those who might say, well, when they saw it, she didn't go there. That's just, she did. And now we have able to marry the evidence of her passport of where she had already gone because she had to, um, disclose that information on the application. And she has those places listed on this advertisement. So her company was not just in Indianapolis. It was not just in New York. And it was global and was getting ready to expand um, a lot further. Can you speak to some of the documents that you've seen that actually speak to that? But yeah, but you know, I'm just looking at this map. This is a really out of proportion. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That is, I had, I, you know, it's so funny. Every time you 
there's so many documents. And every time I look at a document, I see something that I hadn't noticed before. So in order to get Cuba in there, they've kind of elongated the, <laughs> the But that's really interesting to, to be very intentional about showing that. But yes, because she was writing letters back to Mr. Ransom, we know where she was. I can almost tell you from day to day which city she was in. And because Mr. Ransom was very intentional about making sure that what she was doing was covered in the black press, he was writing news releases and sending them, communicating that. So we could see when you know there was the coverage of her visit to Haiti, to a prison in Haiti, where she took food to the prisoners. But she was writing about that. She was very um, smart and savvy about promotion. And she said, first, you have to have a great product, but you also have to promote it. And her story in some ways became, yes, it is about the hair care products, but it is about the overall narrative of social justice, of economic empowerment. And she wanted to tell that story as well. And you can see that in this idea of we are international. We are, we are where people um, are making change. So after her death, how um, far did the products reach? Did they ever reach into the continent of Africa? They did. Um, I, you know, I remember as a little girl coming to, taking the train with my mother to Washington, D.C. and going to the Ethiopian embassy because there was someone in one of the prominent families in Ethiopia who had attended a Walker school. Uh, Madam Walker really was very interested in trying to start a school for girls in Liberia. That school was never founded, but there were students from Liberia who she gave scholarships to and who um, she wanted to involve with the company. And then when the Walker Company had a big anniversary in 1960, the guests of honor were diplomats from Ghana. So there was always this consciousness of connecting to the larger world. Some of that, you know, Susan, I think may have been the fact that she was a member of the AME church, mm -hmm. that even as a poor washerwoman, she was exposed in her church at St. Paul AME to visiting missionaries. And of course, when she was in Indianapolis, she was a member of Bethel AME. Mm -hmm. And we'll learn a lot more as you've already um, discussed, Tyrone, um, Freeman in his book where he really delves deep into the AME church, not just in Indianapolis, but across the country and throughout the world. So um, stay tuned for that and more. <laughs> um, I know we it gets trite, but we're going to deal with it just a little bit. Everybody wants to know how much was she worth and what did she make? But what I found this um, collection to be really helpful with was to talk about it in some real terms and not just mythical terms. So I included the pictures because they're really great images of her in the car. But as Callie can see, we also have the registration. Um, and to keep this kind of brief, I didn't add another one. There's a great letter where she's writing to um, Freeman Ransom about buying a car for Lelia. Right. Okay, so I think Susan may have frozen a little bit, so I'll talk while until she gets back. I was but say, maybe, maybe do this one. Um, if you talk about maybe the car, um, it's one of my favorite pictures. But if you guys have any questions about the uh, for Lelia, as we're kind of getting towards the end, please put them in the chat, and we'll make sure that we get to them. Um, but let me. You want me to go to the car first, or sure, sure. Okay, cool. I'll do that. So this is Madam Walker and Lelia in the car, and actually in front of their house that was at 640 Northwest Street, that's now MLK, with their chauffeur. And I think that's Mr. Patton, I'm not sure. But um, they both loved great cars. This car, I believe, was a coal that was manufactured in Indianapolis. I think that's right. A coal touring car. And then the famous um, picture of 
Madam Walker in the Waverly Electric, which was also made in Indianapolis. If but, anybody's from Indianapolis, if you know the Cole Noble neighborhood, that's where the coal cars were named after and are from. It's now where like Sun King Brewing is and sort of on your way in from the eastern side. Sorry, my there's no, a big thank you about it. it because I need to come, I need to come <laughs> get a tutorial for you from you from all of these great the great knowledge that you have. But yeah, Madam Walker and Lelia both love cars. And apparently Lelia had said to her mother that she wanted a new car, a Cadillac. And so Madam Walker is writing to F.B. Ransom saying, well, you know, I just bought this car for Lelia. She wanted it for Christmas and I was able to get it at this price. And, and so I just went ahead and bought it. <laughs> you know? And he's like, well, you know, how I'm, you're spending so much money. Um, how can I? <laughs> control you i can't and she's like well you know i just wanted to do it but i think that shows you the relationship between the two women that she really spoiled her daughter uh and wanted her to have the things that she wanted i will say one of my favorites is the one where she's driving the car madam walker had enough money she would never would have driven a car but she <laughs> did it to stage to show that she was a powerful woman who owned this car enough to drive it uh, I just, when I heard that story, and then I found out that we had this uh, driver's license for it, that kind of put the icing on the cake for me. <laughs> it puts the icing on the cake. So that Waverly, now she, apparently she did drive that, but that was, you know, the electric cars were considered cars for women. They were smaller cars and they were kind of designed for women. Not very w many women were driving. But Mrs. Reynolds told me that sometimes in the afternoon, they would go to, for a ride together, that Madam Walker would drive around in her little Waverly as they sight, were doing sightseeing along the canal. Oh, what a place to go sightseeing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have a question from the audience um, about where did Madam Walker live in Indianapolis and is her house still around? Um, is it a museum? heartbreaking that the house is not still there. So if everyone knows where the Walker building is uh, at Indiana Avenue and what's now Martin Luther King, to, to just north of that is the old funeral home that was there, that's still there, the facade is still there. And then just a little north of that would have been 640 Northwest Street and that's where her house was. And there are pictures of her house I I at the Indiana Historical Society. Then just north of that was E.F. Mon, M-O-H-N, feed store. Uh, because at that point, you know, you needed feed for the people who had horses. But she bought that building and expanded her company, um, some of her offices, into the, into the feed store. Now, that building was around, I think, as late as the 1970s. The, the house had been torn down maybe in the 50s. My, my friend Paul Mullins, who teaches at IUPUI, knows this. And Callie, you may know these details I, as Paul well. Paul has done amazing work on um, the archaeology and anthropology of that area. You can find some of it at IUPUI. Um, and the history of what's now we call Ransom Place, but named after Mr. Ransom uh, and all the influence he had. Right. So. But yeah, her, when she moved there, that she uh, rent, she first was living with um, a physician who was in Indianapolis uh, for a little while. And then she bought this house. And then the, right behind it was the factory that had been kind of a stable. And she turned that into a factory. Um, so I know I will give a plug for a future event that we're going to do together. But Dolly wanted to know a little bit about Self Made. Um, so, which is the limited edition, limited series that Netflix put out about Madam Walker. So I'll give a plug, keep an eye out for late June. We're going to do an event with Alelia all about that. But do you want to give just a little bit about it and how it came to be? Sure. That's right. Cutting June 30th, right? Yes. Come back. <laughs> Come back to Zoom with us. We're going to do lots of details on it. But so Self Made, the um, series that stars the amazing Octavia Spencer, as Madam Walker premiered on March 20th on Netflix. And it is, as they say, inspired by my book, On Her Own Ground, which you can buy at the Indiana Historical Society website. 
but it was inspired by a book that is 293 pages with end notes and citations. <laughs> so of course, in four 45 minute segments, you can only have about that much of what's in the book. But self-made is very much a Hollywood dramatization, very fictionalized, but I think Octavia Spencer embodies Madam Walker's courage and tenacity, gives you a sense of her drive and what some of the sacrifices are that are required to develop a business. The thing it doesn't do is to give you a sense of her philanthropy, her political activism. You don't really get a sense of these women of the church the AME church who mentored her and who helped to give her a vision of herself to get her to the point where she was ready to start a business. Mr. Ransom, who I think if I had been writing it, would have been a major character because he was such a smart hire on her part. He was the person who crossed the T's and dotted the I's and, a, and kept things going in the home office so she could be expansive and visionary and travel around the country. So there's a lot that is uh, not in there, but I, I think many people have been inspired by it. I think the one other thing I will say is that Madam Walker had a real life rival competitor named Annie Malone, who was in St. Louis, who was a very successful entrepreneur and philanthropist and who developed a business and they were equals in terms of competition. In the um, series, you see a woman who doesn't, is not, is the, a composite character who I think kind of diminishes the real life Annie Malone. And so you get the sense that she's just a jealous person, but that's not the real person. There, the other key part of that is that Madam Walker and Annie, and Annie Malone, the real life person, were about the same complexion. So this colorism theme of, one woman being lighter skinned and one being darker skinned and the competition that happened as a result of that was very much hyped by the script writer. Gotcha. I'm going to toss it back over to Susan, who I think is uh, yes. back with us. She's back. Hey, and the sun is really shining over here. So go figure. When it was pouring, my internet was just fine. But at any rate, um, I look forward to that. Um, on June 30th. And for those of you who have not already Reddit can go see um, one in the first of many blogs that are on the IHS website that talks about some of the characters that are real and why we chose them um, to be in the You Are There as opposed to the made-up characters that are in Self-Made. Um, and there's more to come, looking at John Hardrick and uh, as well as some others. And one of the biggest takeaways from this what's true and what's not is that Madam Walker didn't go from St. Louis to Indianapolis. She went from St. Louis to Denver and Denver to Pittsburgh and actually had her own manufacturing establishment and a beauty college before she came to Indianapolis. So we get this really twisted, compressed, um, non-factual timeline about her life. So that's why I'm going to shift gears to go back to the papers, why we're here today, why the papers are important, and what each and every one of you can do on your own from the luxury of your own home while your internet works. <laughs> and um, But you can go and look at the digitized collection, and there are over 40,000 images, documents, etc., that are scanned. And we have a couple of slides that kind of speak to that, and it's important. So as that collection came back in the 80s, and then it was processed, and then another piece of that collection came at a later date to go with this, in 2016, we applied for a grant from, it's a national grant, highly competitive, the Council of Library and Information Resources for Hidden Collections. And we didn't make the cut. But in 2018, we reapplied and we were successful and we were one of, I think, 107 grantees to get this significant over $80,000 worth of funds to what digitize the collection so that lay people, scholars, filmmakers, um, and others could actually look at the documents and see what's real. And 
have evidence and citations, primary source information, um, history day projects and the like. And anyone who's just curious can sit and look to their heart's content, particularly since we can't go inside to look at it. But when you, we have the time and it's, we're all able, you can come in and hold them in your hand. You can actually see her handwriting, her pictures, her letters, Freeman's letters, Lelia's, and so many others. Oh, I will say, <laughs> it looks like we paused Susan again, but um, I will say that when, in order to digitize a collection of this scale, there's a lot of pieces that go into that. Um, what when you get to go to um in to images.indianahistory.org that's where you can find our digital collections you can scroll down into the madam cj walker collection and i put a more specific link earlier into the chat again that's also going to be emailed out to you tomorrow about 10 a.m but um in order to get that process we don't just scan them and put them up there we have to do all these little things behind the scenes to make sure that when you go and search for them, you can find what you want and you can find a Violet Reynolds letter versus Madam C.J. Walker's driver's license. Um, that's all in process we call tagging in the library land. Um, I call it library land because I don't actually live in library land. Um, I just moonlight there occasionally. Um, and that then goes up into our online content um, which, and you can kind of see, I know that one of the things that they and a number of our staff worked really hard on is making sure that that metadata, all those pieces behind the scenes were up to date so that that way, when you went to search for it, you know that this car is from 1917 and not from 1923. And you can find that um, and kind of start to piece together what those stories are about the collection. Um, before we go again, if you've got other questions, please make sure to add them into the chat. But Alilia, I wanted to come back and make sure we talk about why is it so important that people keep papers and give and donate them to IHS and have them so that people can dig into it. You know, I, I'm so glad that you mentioned this. I would it said, you know, I could not have written this these books that I write without these papers. And if you um, throw away family papers, you have basically erased the history and the legacy of your family. And I think that many people will think, oh, you know, why are my family's papers important? Those birth certificates, those school reports, all of those things that, you know, that your mother saved or that your grandmother saved, those tell the story of a family. And then they expand out and they tell the story of a neighborhood. And then they tell the story of a city and the story of a state and the story of a country. So every single thing to tell what was going on contemporarily with a family. Like right now we're going through, when we're going through this pandemic, uh, people are keeping journals, people are sending emails, people are you know, doing artwork. All of those things are gonna be a reflection of what we were going through during this era. And that helps make history and it helps people like me who are trying to tell stories about people and about an era have all of the little details and gems that help make history come alive. So yeah, Callie, I, you should say something more about why it's important. I, I would say, um, I know Susan's back and I want her to have the last <laughs> word, but I, um, I work as a historian. I plan events for a living about the amazing, awesome, and ridiculous things we have in our collection amongst other adjectives. And without them, it's hard. I, I wasn't here in, Indiana in 1996 or 1916. Um, and so we are always trying to collect and share the whole story of Indiana. Um, if you have things during this pandemic that you want to give, Bethany just put in the chat a link to our COVID collecting initiative. Um, what we found when we look back at the 1918 flu pandemic is we don't have a lot on it. People didn't really want to talk about it. And other than some newspapers, we have very little. And so we want to make sure that with COVID-19, with Corona, in 100 years when the grad students of the future are writing their theses or the Alilias <laughs> are writing about the history of their great grandparents, they have that around. And so if you want, um, we'd love to have that from you. Uh, I would, can I just, just say one thing, Susan, oh, that 
it, with my grandmother's biological family, the May's family actually were free people of color who moved from North Carolina to Indiana in the 1820s and 1830s. They were part of the Robert Settlement and Orange Lick, Lick Creek. So I was at, I actually could find things about a great, great, great grandmother because African Americans had to register as free people of color when they came to the state. And I saw this description of one of my great, great grandmothers whose name was Samira. And she was described as a five foot tall mulatta. Well, I'm a five foot tall, <laughs> would have been described in that way. I could see my family in those records. And I think everybody who's on here has a family member somewhere in those records, if not at the Indiana Historical Society, in the National Archives, whether it's military records, whether it's educational records, we tell our story as Americans by these records. Absolutely. And we do have some Robert Settlement items. We do have a collection of the roles and records. Uh, I don't think they're the original ones, but um, I can't think off the top of my head right now, the man that compiled them, but I have held them in my hand, the originals at the state archives. Different counties actually have um, the books and they're in calligraphy script and it is amazing to see and hold in your hand from little children. They say mulatto, black, Negro, color, all kinds. Of, but the distinctions are there and often have who sponsored them and they had to pay a bond so as not to become a threat on the uh, and a burden on the economy of the town that they were in mm -hmm. um, at the time. So those are there. We have Freeman Ransom papers. So you can stretch beyond Madam Walker and look at the Ransom family. Uh, there's a documentary that's on file there right now. That's not all um, digitized, but as soon as we get back, you can take a look at those. So there are a lot of reasons to tell these stories and I'm always looking for new ones um, to add to our collection to flesh that out. And on this Saturday, I actually will, I'm gonna give another plug out for the Indiana African American Genealogy Group. And Denise Chisley is actually on, I can see her on the screen right now. And I will be talking about what the things you can access at IHS and other places to help you do genealogy, particularly while we're what? Virtual. So there's so much for us to share and so much to keep. And the pack rats, I'm one of them. <laughs> My mother says, you're just like your daddy, who was like his father who kept everything. But that's what helps us tell our stories. That's what helps us tell each other's stories, our personal stories, from weddings to funerals, to love letters, to hate mail. I mean, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> and, and that's how Aaliyah gets to write her books that we get to enjoy. And then we get to watch on the big screen. So it all comes full circle by keeping, telling our stories and the oral histories that we tell to our children, that our grandparents and our parents and our friends and our neighbors share with us. So thank you for sharing with us today, Aaliyah. Yes. You and know, I totally wanted to do I questions. love that we have such a big group. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming again. Um, we will. We have recorded this session, and we will be uploading it to YouTube in a, at least a week or two. So please keep an eye out for that. If you enjoyed this conversation and you want to come back for more, boy, do we have it for you. Um, again, next Thursday, we're talking about historic underwear through the ages. On Saturday the 23rd, we have a special history happy hour about the Indianapolis 500. On May 17th, if you want something a little different and you've been keeping up with the documentary on ESPN called The Last Dance and want to relive 1996 bowls like I lived through, um, come join us on Zoom with the Smithsonian affiliates um, to learn about the life and image of Michael Jordan um, with Dr. Damian Thomas, from the cura who is a curator at the National Museum of African American History. Um, and then on the 23rd, before you come for some 500 history, um, join us for a family history workshop where we'll teach you about how you can identify and label your family images and your photographs. That way your 
your ancestors don't have to hunt for them or your kids when they actually want to look at them. Um, all of that and more is available at indianahistory.org. You're going to get an email from us tomorrow about 10 a.m. I've mentioned it before. It'll have a bunch of links in it. It'll also have an evaluation. It'll take you literally one minute. We'd love to know what you thought, how we can make these better, and what we can keep offering in the future as your, from your couch to our couches. If you missed your chance to uh, donate to the Indiana Historical Society and want to help us keep telling these stories and preserving these collections, um, you can do that at indianahistory.org. Um, and there'll be a link to that in the emails that you get and the email you'll get tomorrow. Um, we hope you stay safe and healthy um, and we'll hope to see you soon. Thanks so much for coming.